Our next speaker is Alexis Wilson. Alexis joins us from El Paso, Texas. She has a background in biology with a biomedical focus and aims to combine her past research experience with her passion for marine conservation here at Scripps. She was a competitive swimmer on a US swim team and spent time before coming here um, uh, with an ocean and fisheries lab at the University of Mississippi, where she uh, did a 40-day cruise in the Gulf of Mexico. So she brings a lot of science and research expertise to her program. And that really informs her project today, uh, which is quite sciencey, and uh, with the support of Dick Norris. And the name of her presentation is Time Capsules of the Ocean, a Record of Abundance of Shark Denticles and Fish Teeth. Welcome, Alexis. <laughs> So here's a picture of some mud. When most people see this, their first thought that probably comes to mind is that it's dirty, sticky, and probably something that's overall pretty insignificant. I actually had the same exact thought while I was out on my first research cruise. Not knowing what this mud was being used for, I thought it was a pretty weird thing to collect and didn't really see the value in it. So on that research cruise, I was one of the few biologists on board, there to collect biological data, which included some samples of some really fascinating deep sea organisms as seen here. So occasionally while I was working on the ship, I would notice a large contraption being hauled out of the ocean. This contraption, which I later learned was a sediment core, would descend to the ocean floor to collect sa sediment samples from the deep sea. During my time on the ship, I had pretty little interest in these sediment cores. Every time I saw it coming back up, I was like, oh, that's cool. There goes the paleontologist crew going back to play with their mud again. And I would return my focus elsewhere. It wasn't until I started this program and attended a talk about ocean sediments from a, geolog a geologist at Scripps, who now happens to be, be my advisor for this project, Dr. Dr. Richard Norris, that I realized how fascinating and important these sediment cores are. They are not just mud, they are time capsules preserving valuable information about the history and dynamics of our oceans. These sediments play a critical role in ocean conservation and expanding our understanding of the history of our oceans. They are filled with the potential to unlock secrets of our planet's past and guide us towards a better understanding of its future. This realization is what has transformed my perception of deep sea sediments and has been what has inspired this project. So looking at sediments from the deep sea is basically like looking at the past. Anything and everything that has ever lived in the ocean will eventually sink and make its way onto the ocean floor. These sediments act as a record, capturing pieces of marine life um, and other materials that settle onto them. They are a direct reflection of the ocean's history over spans of millions of years ago. From great white sharks to tiny plankton, we are able to get a glimpse of what kind of marine organisms existed at certain places and at certain times. And by taking a look at these marine sediments, it allows scientists to gain insight on the Earth's past ocean dynamics. So some examples of what kind of information these sediments provide include physical changes such as temperature changes, salinity variations, and shifts in ocean circulation patterns. When looking specifically at the marine fossils that come from these sediments, they can provide us with a lot of information about marine organism abundances, distributions, and migrations. And this is particularly interesting because it can allow scientists to learn more about evolution, adaptation, and ex extinction events that occurred in our past oceans. So what about this specific study? This research project is focused on isolating and counting fish teeth and shark dermal denticles to establish a two million year long record of abundance of these fossils. So our study spans all the way back to the Pleistocene, which occurred around 2.5 million to 11,000 years ago. And the Pleistocene time period, largely popularized by the Ice Age movie franchise, is mostly known for the megafauna that existed during this time, such as mammoths, saber-toothed cats, and giant ground sloths, just to name a few. And this time period was also characterized by numerous glacial interglacial cycles, which had significant impacts on our oceans. These cycles influenced sea levels, global temperatures, marine habitats, and ended up leading to many evolutionary and ecological changes, similar to what we are seeing today with human-driven climate change. So why are we even looking at these fossils? Establishing a record of fish abundances from the Pleistocene allows us to assess how these organisms have reacted to past environmental changes, such as temperature shifts. 
And this comparison helps us to understand their resilience and vulnerability to the changing environmental conditions. And this sort of record is very important because it'll help establish a baseline data of shark and fish abundances over time. And this will then help us to gain insight on ecosystem dynamics and evolutionary history, and in turn provide context for current and future marine conservation. So the study also aims to fill a gap in knowledge. While there's a documented geological record of marine life in the Pacific, there is no similar record in the Atlantic. And instead of grouping all fish fossils together, we decided to produce a separate count of shark fossils. And we chose this approach because sharks are especially vulnerable populations and are pretty difficult animals to survey um, to find more out about their population dynamics. So a little information about shark denticles. Each species of sharks have a unique layer of skin that is covered with dermal denticles. The purpose of these denticles is to provide the shark with protection and also reduce resistance in the water as they are swimming just to create less drag. And over time, sharks will shed these denticles and they will fall onto the sediments on the ocean floor where we can go look at them. And so here's an example of what shark denticles look like. They are really small. Um, this is a picture taken under a microscope. And just to put in perspective, that white line in the corner represents 100 micrometers, which is around the same size as the diameter of your own hair. And here's another picture of denticles not under the microscope, just for a better perspective of how small they actually are. They're similar to a grain of sand. And so here's a simplified look at the methods for this project. We already had the sediment samples that were collected from a cruise in 2016 from the Cape Basin, South Africa. And this location was chosen because it's highly productive and there are a lot of different shark, shark populations that reside here. And so from the preserved sediments collected on the ship, they were processed to isolate the fossils from the rest of the sediments. And so this included a series of steps, including washing, drying, acidifying, and a heavy liquid step just to concentrate the teeth and the denticles. So from here, once they were isolated, the samples were counted under the microscope. And this raw count was then turned into a mass accumulation rate of fish remains, which is just basically how many um, teeth and denticles fell onto the seafloor each thousand years. So here's the completed record of abundance. On the bottom, we have age, which goes around present day up to 2 million years. And on the y-axis, we have the cumulative accumulation rate of fish remains, which is, once again, just how many remains um, fell onto the seafloor each thousand years. And we can see that the rate is very sporadic and has significant variability around, um, with the max being 73 fish teeth to a low of two. And so when looking at the shark denticles accumulation rates, they're similar to the total fish teeth in terms of the large fluctuations that we see. For both of these data sets, we hypothesize that these fluctuations are a reflection of temperature shifts that occurred during this time and led to effects on the productivity in the ocean. So data collected from this study also complements a record of a former master's student in the lab who also collected data from six other ocean drills over the span of two million years. And these locations range from the Southern Ocean to the tropics, as well as polar regions. And this study site can be seen circled in red right off the tip of South Africa. And so here's the data from the previous six cores that my data will be complementing. And from here, this shows that there is um, a correlation between latitude and fish productivity shown here. So the four cores with higher rates shown here in yellow are from the equatorial and subtropic zones, which are the warmer areas, while the lower two are from polar regions. And this data is really interesting because it does counter the known notion that polar regions are more productive areas. And so we wanted to compare our data to this to see if it follows the same trend. And so here's our data compared to the other six locations. Um, it's the very sporadic blue line seen here, and we see that it's significantly higher even compared to the other subtropical locations. And this high productivity in our site was expected because this area is already known for its high productivity, but there are also some currents in the location that might be what is contributing to this significantly higher productivity. But otherwise, it is consistent with what this other study found with subtropic locations having a higher productivity compared to the polar regions. And so although this data spans millions of years back, it's still relevant to ocean conservation today. This data is a great tool to see how fish population was before any anthropogenic threats and in turn can be used to guide future management and protection of this species. 
And given the short span of this project, we are only able to complete this record up until two million years ago. And in the future, we would like to complete this record and process the rest of the sediments from this area, which would make the record around seven million years. Um, we would also like to complete a further analysis to determine exactly why these spikes are occurring. For example, we would like to find temperature data from this area and compare it to these spikes to see if they do um, correspond with temperature fluctuations. So besides the record of abundance, um, this data set will complement an unpublished data set to hopefully produce a publishable paper. And another important aspect of this project is to reach a broad audience. And to provide an important resource, I created a story map on ArcGIS that takes users from the bottom of the ocean to research cruises to the laboratory. So, Here's an example of what the story map looks like. Um, in order for this project to be successful, one of my top priorities included communicating this project in a unique and an, an effective manner. And by using this tool, it makes it possible to make complex scientific information accessible and engaging for general audiences, which is very important in order to foster a deeper appreciation for the ocean and also get individuals more involved in marine conservation. And a big thank you to my capstone advisory committee, as well as some undergrad students that helped me process um, the sediments. And besides that, here's the QR code if you wanted to scan and look at the story map. And besides that, are there any questions? I've got a question. Uh, so you mentioned that this record can help us learn more about evolutionary history and adaptations. Uh, do the results from this study give us any information about evolutionary history or adaptations of any marine organisms? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so besides us looking at or getting more information about sharks and just fish overall, we we're actually able to get more information on whale evolution. So um, this, the Great size of large whales have been heavily debated throughout time, and one of the most re recent theories states that um, that climate variability caused by the Pleistocene glacial interglacial cycles has led to a more productive ocean becoming more variable, and then in, in cause that led to more um, variable patches in the ocean. So these whales had to develop their great size just to save energy traveling between these patches. And in our data set, we are actually able to see and or back up this theory just because of the high variability. I have a question over here. Hello. Hi. Um, I'm curious if what factors and variables you may have looked at to decide what uh, sites you were selecting samples from, mm -hmm. and other than just like polar, subpolar, tropical? Yeah, so from the other six sites, that was not my study personally, so I'm not exactly sure of like what went into that. I do know they were com they wanted to compare the polar and subtropical and just see how latitude affects um, um, productivity. For my site, we did pick this just because we know it is a high produ highly productive site, and um, I did want to focus on sharks a bit, and we know that this was like, there's a lot of sharks in this area, and also whale migration does pass through here. So yeah, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I had a very uh, speculative question. Yes. Just do you think this kind of research would lend any knowledge in the history of migratory paths specifically? Oh, sorry, could you repeat that? Well, would you be able to use this research to see how migratory paths may have changed over time? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I think we would definitely have to look at more areas to see that, but I think it definitely could. I know, um, like, just for the whale migrations, we are able to see, like, this high variability, which does support this theory, but I think we definitely need to look at just more areas just to see that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. Great. I I've got one more question, actually. How, so how do you determine the age of the sediments? So the sediments, we're able to look at them, and we do see that there's a lot of the nanofossils and different kind of fossils. And so when we do look at these sediments, um, they're, here, let me pull this up. 
So there's a lot of um, plankton, diatoms, and these are very well studied organisms. So when you look into the sediments and we see like, oh, we found this diatom, then we know it could be traced back to this specific period. And then over time we collect a lot of them and are able to make this age record. Okay, I have a question. In, in the samples that you took, what sort of physical area, two-dimensional area, do your samples cover? So I know you were working at one site, but did, were they multiple cores and over what kind of area? No, so for mine, it was, I'm not exactly sure of the exact size. It was, it was a really, just like this, <laughs> um, just like a little tube that would go in. And so that's why we did want to change like the raw data into the accumulation rate. So that does tell us like um, how many fish teeth fell each thousand years in like a centimeter squared area. Okay. Mm -hmm. okay. Th thank you so much, Alexis. Yeah.